thank you so much for joining me here today. We officially are, I think, 10 days away from the release of Jade Legacy, which I've been given a copy of here. Uh, how's it feel knowing the conclusion to the Green Bone Saga is this close to being in people's hands? It's kind of unbelievable, honestly. It's been such a long journey for me because obviously I was working on the trilogy long before the first book came out. So it's been seven plus years for me living in this world, living with these characters. And it really does feel like uh, you know, reaching the top of the mountain that you've been climbing. And there's this sense of immense satisfaction, uh, relief that you made it because many times along the way, it feels impossible. It just, there's like, it almost feels like, where's the light at the end of this tunnel? Um, and also just a great deal of, um, of bittersweet feeling uh, of, I don't want to leave, but also I'm really um, glad that it has come to a conclusion that I hope is satisfying and um, that that can often be, I mean, for epic fantasy writers, we're in it for such a long haul and um, it's definitely a, a, a threat, right? Of like this dragging on forever and readers getting, um, getting impatient. And so I just hope that people enjoy it. I'm really, really excited to uh, to get it in people's hands and then, uh, and then to sleep. I'm just going <laughs> to vegetate over the holiday break. I've got some great shows that I'm going to line up and some books that I've been meaning to catch up on. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to a restful holidays. I, I do have to ask that you say it's been such a long time, which I'm sure it's seven years it has been, but you've also put these books out. And what I, I think most people will find to be a very reasonable time frame. How do you, find the discipline to sit down and write these books like that because you know me personally some days I wake up to write and I'm like nope <laughs> it's just not happening like every second day honestly <laughs> I I, uh, I mean terror terror helps I think <laughs> um, deadlines uh, so uh, just the constant reminder that this is my job mm -hmm. and that it's my career uh, it's what I depend on um, professionally, financially, uh, I have obligations to my publisher and I, I feel obligation to my readers as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I just have those days when like every writer, it's like chipping through a concrete wall with a spoon, but, um, just like in Shawshank Redemption, eventually you get through. <laughs> I've never seen that imagery before. It's somehow brutally accurate to the writing process. Um, and with this being a final book, I think unanimously among fans, uh, we can confidently say you subverted middle book syndrome where Jade War is just loved. And I can confidently say Jade Legacy, at least in my humble opinion, is even a step up from there. It's a fantastic conclusion that I think, of, yeah, I've still maintained is tied for my favorite read of the year so far. Does it take away some of the nerves to see the fans be so positive to book two? Like, are you pretty confident in book three right now? Or is there still some of that pre-release jitters? I'm feeling pretty confident about book three because at this point, it's so close to being out. And um, I know the, uh, the early reviews have been good. And more importantly, I'm really satisfied with it. I think at some level as a writer, what matters is are you... Uh, are you, it, does it feel true to you? Does it feel like you accomplished what you set out to do? And I, I think if you do that and um, you're, you're true to your vision, uh, your readers will sense that. And you know, I can just hope that that, that comes through on the page um, once they experience it. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about it. I will say during the actual writing process, there is a lot of anxiety of like, I, I really when I was writing Jade War was super cognizant of the fact that the middle book is often the soggy one that people say has second book syndrome and so I was like obsessive about studying sequels and how they work and why some do and some don't and what the pitfalls are and then with Jade Legacy again I was like oh uh, Jade War was hard but like Jade Legacy has to stick the landing or like no one's going to pick up the trilogy so they while you're writing it, those voices are definitely in your head. Um, and hopefully, uh, as, as you near the finish line, they sort of silence, they fall silent. And then you're just left with the work. 
that that leads me nicely into the more gritty hardcore questions well i'll avoid spoilers for book three but the larger themes for the green bone saga as a whole have largely in my opinion hit on you know generational trauma you know the burden of legacy what is your personal reaction to the saying that is often said blood is thicker than water and what would the member of the no peak clan's reaction to be to that saying well i as you know the Greenbone clans are very, um, they're, they're uh, very family focused. There's that, that sort of sense of, of brotherhood and loyalty and clanism that comes through like through the entire s- series. And blood is thicker than water, I think is, is certainly something that is sort of baked into that society. But at the same time, there, it, there's so much um, of the story that also challenges that. And and um, sort of breaks apart what is the idea of family and what do you owe to your family and what constitutes a family because there's certainly um, you know characters who are just as much a part of the family like Andon for example who is the adopted sibling who never feels uh, that he for much of the series doesn't feel like he's really part of the family even though he he is and he's trying to find his own path and question what his role is in the family and uh, characters who are every bit as important to, to the family. Um, and so it's, it really is sort of, yes, family is this huge theme, but family in a broad sense. It, it's mm. kind of qu- qu- kind of expanded that to be um, the, the family as, as the tribe um, mm-hmm. and your, your tribe, your people are your family. And so, um, so yeah, like I, that, that I, I hope that it, it, it captures the sense of a family saga, but um, but family beyond just blood ties. Well, I asked that specific question because it seems like a lot of the consequences these characters have to deal with are due to their loyalty to family. And so I was wondering if you disagree with that sentiment personally, though. Is this your kind of rejection of the idea that you have to stay loyal to family and that's kind of your thesis? Or is it something where you think it's more of a gray mixed bag? I think it's a gray mixed bag. I certainly... Um, wanted to kind of portray both sides mm-hmm. both the um all the the real strength of the family and what you gain from standing together if you think about the no peak clan the call family they are they persevere because they are able to work together and each bring their individual strengths and talents and they're up against uh, really a, a strong woman antagonist in Aitmata who rules her clan with, uh, with a more singular vision where she's kind of got this top-down command and control approach. So it's really only by, by working together um, that they're able to survive, they're able to persevere, but also so much of their, of their pain and suffering and the frictions um, in their lives are also due to family. So it is, it is that duality um, and I'm not coming down on one side or the other. I just want to portray that reality um, as, as authentically as I can. Um, and I, I think I certainly feel that um, in my own life, uh, that sort of push and pull between like your obligation and your duty and your love for your family and also the frustration that they cause you. I, I don't know. Most people seem to not have any frustration from family. That seems very foreign. <laughs> It's such a universal theme. I, I, you know, I do think, you know, I've I've heard so many readers pick up on certain things and just the family relationships, whether it's sibling dynamics. I've heard uh, so many readers are like, oh yeah, like I have a, a a brother and I have like this relationship with them that's that is it rang so true. What Hilo and Shay, how they communicate, or oh yeah, that like relationship with my kids or, you know, there's, there's just so many characters and ways they interact in the books that there's probably something that you recognize in there. I can specifically say Andon, especially was someone who's kind of outside in perspective and very, you know, conflicted within himself. And also thank you for the LGBTQ plus rep um, was someone I just was so in love with, but you mentioned the strength of various characters. And that's a quote I've pulled out here that I love. And I think hits on this very nicely. Um, It was call Hilo's great talent. He could have a single ordinary conversation with a man and make him loyal for life. 
Uh, this addresses something I think many people forget, and that is the danger of charisma, the danger of being able to inspire in others and how that can be used for good or bad. Was there something like, was this something you really wanted to include or is this just kind of a character trait that was, you know, how do you view charisma, charm and oratory for a character like Hilo? Is it a good, is it a bad you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's like you said, it's not a good or a bad. It can be mm -hmm. used for good. It can be used for bad. It is, I, th I think a, um, a, a very powerful trait mm -hmm. that uh, I wanted to include, to express, um, and bring light to life on the page because um, I, I think honestly, when I look at uh, the characters in in the Greenbone Saga, there is a uh, in in many regards kind of different leadership styles among them that are clashing mm -hmm. and contrasting. And I think in a way this comes from my background in business where I, you know, you oftentimes in fiction, you see kind of leaders portrayed in a certain way, like very strong warriors who have great or great at speeches like, I don't know, Captain America or Aragorn, right? Like uh, uh, Optimus Prime, like you sort of have these fictional leaders who fit a mold. And I wanted to show, um, different characters leading in different ways because all of these characters are responsible for a lot of people like Shay has got this whole business tower that answers to her he he loves the pillar of this clan Aitmata has to lead this huge organization she's got a lot um, uh, going against her as well and so they and, and they all have very different personalities and they lead in different ways and Hilo's strength is in his is in IQ, EQ over IQ, right? Like he is so, um, he's such a people person mm -hmm. and uh, his strength is in those personal relationships. Mm -hmm. And he takes everything personally, but he's very loyal to his people and they're very loyal to him. And that was a, a type of character I hadn't really written before. And that was just really compelling to me because in many ways he's underestimated because, um, he because he's kind of got that street charisma um, that works for him when he's a horn. And how does he translate that in a new role when he has to uh, step up to be a leader of a much larger organization? And uh, so, yeah, so I wanted to I, I really just wanted different personalities to shine through and um, different types of leadership styles to be represented. It's it's you touched on something there again that I find to be lethal within the pages here and that's that yes they support each other as family but there's also that that certain vein that nerve they can hit because they're family when they're going at each other yeah. and specifically between Hilo and Shay that's kind of a continual exploitation of the family inside and it it hurts to read it really does and there's some brutal representation of how family can traumatize each other like no other was there ever a line where you thought maybe that was a bit too much and had to reel it back in or were you willing to just go completely to show how dark it can get between these family members caught in this storm well i knew overall that this family had to uh to stand or fall together so mm -hmm. I was never going to go to a place where, uh, I don't know, they they all just threw up their hands and split up and like moved to different countries. <laughs> you know, like, uh, so I, I knew that I was gonna, uh, at the very least that this, the, the saga of them standing together and fighting together was sort of the, the narrative thread that would tie these books together. Um, but within that, uh, yeah, there's some, there's some painful scenes in there. Was it or painful to write? Um, and and the, that uh, I had to approach really carefully because I wanted to hit specific emotional notes. And oftentimes that involved pulling back more than anything else. So um, oftentimes confrontations between family members are subtle mm -hmm. because they have all this history between them. And so what goes unsaid in a moment is just as emotionally significant as what is actually said. So there'd be um, conversations, for example, in the beginning of Jade Legacy, uh, 
there is a lot of um, there are a lot of repercussions from ha- what happened at the end of Jade War, and uh, these characters, Hilo and Shay, Hilo and Wen, they are they're not in a good place, um, and I wanted that to ring true, um, but to also have a sense of hope um, and and reconciliation. Um, so so I get I guess the answer is. Uh, I just was like, how do I make this feel as human as possible? And that, and I'll, it'll be as painful as it's got to be, you know, but it's got to feel true to those characters. Um, and yeah, there's, there's parts in this saga where I know um, uh, people uh, were very divided on characters' decisions and their actions. And um, I, but to your, to your point, no, I never was like, I, I don't, I don't feel like, um, there was, there was a line for me personally where I was like, no, that I'm not going to cross it. I'm going to cross it if the character would cross it. And okay. some of those characters definitely cross it. There's a specifically a scene with Hilo and Shay and the children are involved with, and it just, it ripped my heart out to get through. And I see a lot of my brother in Hilo. And so I wanted to like forgive and be like, no, he's, oh no. Like it just goes to a point where you're like, I gotta let that go. <laughs> Um, but specifically with Jade Legacy, this has a very interesting structural choice where it's jumping forward. It's split into four yeah. parts and it really lives up to the name Legacy as a result. Was that the plan from like book one? You knew that's where you're going to go or was that, oh, you're writing Jade Legacy and you realize we need to start bouncing around? Yeah, I knew it shortly after I wrote Jade City. Okay. So um, what happened was I did not know whether I would get a trilogy out of, uh, out of Jade City because um, I wrote it before it was on without contract. And so I didn't know if it would sell. I didn't know if the publisher would want three books. So I, I knew I had to write Jade City in a way that was satisfying on its own. Mm-hmm. And then when Orbit was like, give us three books, that's when I sat down and was like, okay, how do I, um, how do I plan out books two and three? Mm-hmm. And um, my vision was that this was going to really, this is the story of this generation of green bones. Mm-hmm. Um, and the structure that I, I settled upon was um, Jade City is a pretty tight story about the conflict between the clans and how it kicks off in the city of John Loon. And uh, book two takes that uh, story and expands it internationally. And you see a lot more of the world and Jade Legacy takes that story intergenerational. So that scaffold helped me to define the shape of each of the books. I knew pretty early on that Jade Legacy was gonna be a different kind of beast. Uh, And I had already established the structure in Jade City and Jade War of the interludes that acted as these breaks in the narrative and that I could use for literary effect. And that was the uh, natural mechanism that I could use to move forward in time when it came to telling Jade legacy. And I, I mean, time jumps are, are always a risk. Um, some people are fine with them. Some readers are just gonna bounce off of them. Um, there's different ways that you can handle passage of time. Um, so uh, my approach was to look at Jade legacy almost like a four season television show in which each of the interludes demarks kind of the end of a season so that those four sections each have their own mini narrative arc, but they land in a way that there's unresolved questions and you pick up a few years later and they all build together for the entire book. Uh, So it just, um, it was like, Honestly, it was like eating an elephant one bite at a time. I just had to t- <laughs> find a way to break it up in a way that was manageable. And, um, and that structure uh, helped me when I was writing. Now, I've never asked anyone this question before, but I'm really curious about your answer. If you could go back in time and hand you know, Fonda Lee, who just wrote Jade City, a copy of Jade Legacy, how surprised would she be at the result? Oh, gosh. Um, I, I don't think she would be surprised at the story itself and how it turned out. Uh, she would be 
surprised that it exists. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, at least I'm sure you're sure it would be good news, right? Yes. Uh, you'd be like, it's yeah. going to be this stressful, but I, it's going to happen. I, I honestly, I think she'd be like, you wrote a book that long? Like, I. <laughs> well, I'm when glad I wrote Chase that. City, that was the longest book I had written mm -hmm. up until that point. Uh, and I don't think I could have conceived of writing a book like even larger because Chase City felt ambitious to me at the time that I conceived it and wrote it. And uh, if you'd be like, actually, you're going to kind of like cube that in terms of complexity, I would have been like, you nuts. Well, you've just gotten some of the most exciting news I personally feel an author can get. And that is there is a Green Bone Saga adaptation. I'm sure there's not too much you can tell us. But as fans, I would just love to know what it was like finally getting that confirmation. And, you know, is there anything beyond just it's happening that we can be made aware of? So it's a funny thing with adaptation news, because often the announcement of that news is way later than it actually happening. And this goes, this is true for publishing as well. Sometimes okay. you get the news and then it's forever until you can talk about it. And in the case of the Jade City TV adaptation, that was even more so because it was optioned not that long after Jade City was released. So it would have been like Whoa. 2018 sometime. And it was, I'm going to have to go back and look, but like over a year, maybe over like a year and a half before it was actually public because um, it was optioned and there was a producer and director attached, but they didn't have a writer. They want, didn't want to announce it until there was a writer in place. Mm -hmm. And the studio had, uh, they went through quite the process to find the writer. At one point, there were a couple of writers attached, um, but they got, that, that fell through. There was another writer hired who was committed to another project and got pulled away to do something else. And they didn't like the script. And finally, they brought on the current writer. And so uh, that, then that whole process took a while and then it was shopped around to networks and then it landed on a network. So there was this, multi-stage process that I couldn't talk about um, mm -hmm. and then when it was finally announced of course people were super excited uh, but I, I was like I've known about this for like years already <laughs> well so my excitement was more secondhand it was just more the excitement of seeing other people excited about it and uh, it's uh it is an interesting process it's it's very there's so many uh, layers to it and so many hoops to jump through and it's very different as an author who's pretty much used to just working alone and once my publisher says yeah we're gonna buy this book there's not much else to do until I finish the book and it's very different um, with adaptation because there's so many executives involved and many layers of checkpoints so uh, I mean I, I can tell you right now it is in the script writing stage so it's at the point where scripts are being written um, but production has not yet been greenlit. So there will be another series of gates um, in which uh, someone has to uh, write a check for a bucket ton of money for it to actually go into production. Right. And, and, and as an author, you, you kind of have to temper your, your enthusiasm as well, because who knows how long development hell will last. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I don't also don't want to get too excited about speculating the things and then my readers being like, well, it didn't happen. Like, <laughs> and so it's, uh, it, it's this constant, um, like fingers crossed, but don't get uh, too, get excited, but don't get too excited. Uh, and every, every gate, you just kind of hope that it continue. People keep pushing the peanut along. It's funny, that's probably the most honest answer I've ever seen to a question like that, because from what I understand, it is very difficult to get through development, and it's, people freak out when they hear like, oh, a writer moved, but it's like, that's so standard, especially early on, things yeah, can just yeah. pass and pass, and yes. it's not until that, it's it's a snowball effect where it starts slow, and then it just, oh, now we got a cat, okay, now it's, in, and then we're there. <laughs> it, it's a miracle anything gets made, actually. Yeah. It really, it really is. I have uh, writer friends who said, I will believe it when I am sitting in the theater looking at the screen and then yeah. it'll be real. Well, I, I'd like to think which, if you're sitting on the set watching it be recorded, <laughs> I hope at some point you can <laughs> let yourself <laughs> enjoy. <laughs> 
Um, well, if I could be someone in the background shot, I'd appreciate it, but I understand if not. Uh, <laughs> Kill me in the helicopter crash I, or something. It's great. I, I would, de I'm definitely going to try and fight for a cameo. I'll be like, just let me be a, I don't know, a noodle shop owner, whatever, like <laughs> do a Stan Lee kind of thing. That would, I would love to see it. Well, uh, thank you so much for being willing to sit down and talk Jade Legacy for me. I can genuinely say tied for favorite read this year. It's absolutely outstanding. And I, I'm probably more excited for the adaptation of this than just about anything else coming down the road, except for Wheel of Time. Sorry, that's, I got to just, you know, that's my favorite. Very understandable. <laughs> well, I'm delighted to hear that. Thank you again for, you know, for, for uh, talking about these books on your channel. And it's, I, I, I mean, on, honestly, super honored because I know how many books you read a year. I can't even like fathom it. And so hu hugely honored and, and glad that you enjoyed the conclusion and that it stuck the landing for you. Well, thank you so much. I will have links for all of Fonda Lee's stuff down below. Books, social media, the merch store where you can get fantastic merch like this. I know it's hard to promote your merch store as an author. I'm happy to do it for you. <laughs> and be sure to check out Jade Legacy dropping on my birthday. November 30th. So thank you for the birthday present. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>